everybody. Welcome to our uh, webinar today, The EV Revolution, How EVs Are Completely Reshaping the Auto Industry. I'm Joe Archunas uh, here from Electrify Now and New Buildings Institute here, as always, with Brian Stewart, founder of Electrify Now. We're really excited about our panel today and our live viewing of a Ford F-150 Lightning. So, Brian, talk to us a little bit about today's subject. Why are we talking about electric vehicles? All right. Well, there's tons of excitement about electric vehicles, no matter what you're thinking. In a lot of cases, it's just because they're such great cars. But I do want to remind people that, you know, one of the reasons why this is such an important topic is if you look at where emissions come from, there's obviously a huge chunk from electricity. But transportation in this country, and it's similar around the world, is over a quarter of the emissions that come every year uh, from, and you will see what that looks like in a minute. And then, of course, heat's another big uh, piece of it. Some of it comes from agriculture and other processes like making cement, but over 80% of our emissions come from energy, from burning fossil fuels, and transportation is one of those big, big sources of uh, carbon emissions. And if you dive into the transportation sector, what you see is the vast majority of the emissions that come from this area are from cars and light trucks. Like the car, it's the, the vehicles that people like you and I own are the vast majority of transportation emissions, of course, those big trucks you see on the freeway, that's part of it, but airfare, uh, sorry, air traffic and shipping and rail is, is very small in comparison to the emissions from our own automobiles, which is why it's exciting to, tie, to look at the amazing products that are coming along to avoid all those emissions. And the other thing I'd just point out, and part of the reason why the, the whole industry, including the shipping industry, is so interested in this is because there's, EVs are just so much incredibly so much more energy efficient than gas automobiles. This is a comparison of two cars that are exactly the same, except that one is the gas version of this car, in case in this case, the Hyundai Kona, and the Hyundai EV, the exact same car that with an electric drive train, um, can, you can get over five times the amount of uh, miles for the same amount of fuel. And Aaron, who, who's gonna be talking about his uh, F-150 later on here in a minute, it will talk what that looks like for his car. But this is one of the reasons why it's so exciting to, to be um, getting, thinking about EVs because they're so much more energy efficient and lower cost to operate. So today we're really going to be talking about um, what are the challenges that face the new and also existing automakers in, in this huge transition. You know, we, we said in our intro that a lot of us have lived through the, the um, huge disruption in the telephone industry that happened with smartphones and the same kind of thing is happening with EV. So how are these, these big automakers dealing with this transition that's quite complicated in terms of their whole manufacturing infrastructure? And then of course you've got these upstart players. Which one of these uh, folks are gonna be, oh, look at this, is this Zach? Uh, Zach tuning in, that's fantastic. Yes, yes I'm here. Oh my goodness. Wow. We were not sure you were going to make it. So I've actually been on for a few minutes and I thought I was on it as a panelist, but all the settings were different. So, okay. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm so glad you made it. I'm so glad you're safe. We will have to hear about what things are like down there in Florida here in a minute, but I'm dying to hear, but I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Zach. So, uh, yeah. So Zach is going to be taking through a lot of this exact information about, you know, what's happening behind the scenes with the current automakers and the new automakers, who looks best um, prepared to really thrive with this new transition. And, um, you know, what do we think about what the field of players is going to look like in the future? And then we'll touch a little bit on the Inflation Reduction Act and what that means. There's some really great things in here, but some important changes that's important for people to understand about how that's going to affect the prices of EVs and also where EVs are made and how they're made. And then how all this is gonna change even the way we buy cars. Um, so plenty to talk about here and we'll be diving into all these topics uh, uh, today. Finally, we're gonna just try to give everyone who's on board towards the end a little bit of general advice about what to think about when, when purchasing an EV. Great. So let me uh, introduce our panelists without further ado. Um, first, we're gonna hear from Aaron Smith, who's the president of eBuy. You can see he's standing out there. We're gonna uh, spotlight or uh, spotlight him. Then I'm gonna encourage you know Brian and 
and and Zach and and if folks who have questions about the Ford F one fifty Lightning to kind of comment and and interact with with Aaron as he's showing us around his great uh, car. So Aaron's the president of EBA, uh, which is the Energy and Environmental Building Alliance. He has over twenty five years experience in home construction, building products, sustainability, and nonprofit board leadership. He's worked for companies including Kohler. Uh, um, OpenR and a ASSA, Abloy, sorry if I'm butchering that, Aaron, as well as startups in Silicon Valley and his own building and remodeling company has served various nonprofit boards and co-founded the CT Collaborative, the Living Building Challenge. And then amazingly, we'll be hearing from uh, Zachary Shahan uh, from Florida. Uh, he's the CEO of the incredible blog, Clean Technica. He's been trying to help society uh, one word at a time. He spends most of his time on Clean Technica as its director, chief editor, and CEO. Um, he's recognized globally as an electric vehicle, solar energy, and energy storage expert, and he's presented about clean tech at many, many conferences. Uh, so excited uh, to have uh, Zachary here with us today. Yeah, and I just I don't want to take over the show, but uh, so we're just starting to get hit with the. We've been getting hit all day with uh, by Hurricane Ian, but we're getting hit now with the just starting to get hit with these uh, red, super strong wind bands. So we lost internet and and electricity for a little bit, uh, getting on. That's why I'm late. I think probably I should start uh, instead of Aaron because I might get knocked off at any moment for the rest. All right, of the let's day. do that. Let's do that, and then we'll but, come back and we'll introduce Jr. Um, at the end. You can we, you can do we, Jr.'s we, introduction we, first, and then then I'll. Okay. If you sounds good. Yeah. Zach, do you want to share your screen or do you want me to drive your slides? Yeah, you could do the slides. That would be great. Okay. I'm cool. not sure if I have. All right, you want to introduce JR? Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. And then let me, let's round out our panel. Perfect. JR Anderson serves as a force program manager for the Access to Cars team with a focus on engaging with consumers around electric vehicles. And he was hired as one of the first salespeople for uh, Tesla. Um, so let's uh, let, let's move without further ado to um, to Zach, and, uh, and then we'll get to the F-150 uh, Lightning. Perfect. And yeah, Zach, again, sorry. huge thanks for, for joining us. Yeah. Hurricane. And I don't know how much you can hear. I hear constant wind and rain, and sometimes the shingles on our roof are blowing off right now. So it's a little bit wild. Uh, so I don't know how much you'll hear that, but it's it's definitely distracting me. We're, we're so, not hearing anything. And we're not just, hearing anything. But man, if, you, if you have to go, imagine. Zach, at any point, we totally yeah. understand. <laughs> no, I mean, I just might get kicked off at any point. I mean, I, I was logging on, and our electricity went out, and then the internet was out, and I was trying to reset it for 15 minutes. That's not my house behind me. We live in a in a in a townhouse, but I'm upstairs um, in the scary part right now. So eager to get back downstairs. Uh, so my presentation today is about how different automakers are leaning into the EV transition, and just start with a little bit of background on the EV market. Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, yeah. So just globally, we are now at. 10% of new vehicle sales being fully electric. 10% of new vehicle sales globally are now fully electric. 14% have a plug. So those include the plug-in hybrids, 4% plug-in hybrids, basically. So if you look at the top automotive groups in the first half of 2022, when, this, when we uh, are, are talking about these numbers, the number one automaker for plug-in vehicle sales, so this includes plug-in hybrids, is BYD a Chinese company that dominates the Chinese EV market. We'll get to that in a moment. Then you have Tesla, who everybody knows, uh, which has just uh, been seeing phenomenal growth for a decade and now up to um, over a million vehicles a year of production. And Volkswagen Group, which has been climbing in the past year or two as it has put more models on the market and ramped up production. And then you have a couple of Chinese automakers, Shanghai Auto something, Sake, and Geely Volvo. Geely is a parent company, but it owns Volvo, Volvo cars, not Volvo trucks, and a number of other brands. So you see the global market basically dominated in plug-in vehicle sales by Chinese brands plus Tesla and Volkswagen. We'll get to the next slide. So now we're looking at full electric. So those were plug-ins that include full electric and plug-in hybrids, and this is full electric only. And so the top automotive group automotive groups for the first half of the year are Tesla in this case. BYD is second because a lot of those sales we just mentioned were plug-in hybrids. And then you have Sake again, Volkswagen Group, and now you see Hyundai Kia pop onto this top five list uh, for for full electrics only. And again, this was, you know, we we just looked at the 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 year to, the first six months uh, share. 
but in the month of June, twelve percent of of vehicle sales were fully electric globally. So you can see this just keeps climbing. So I'll just do a quick note on the Chinese market, which is the next slide. So oh sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. This was a great <laughs> suggestion from from someone else here on the panel, but. Uh, just wanted to compare those numbers to top selling automakers in the world overall. So last year, the top selling automakers in the world were this list. Toyota was number one, Volkswagen Group, Renault, Renault, Renault Nissan, Mitsubishi Alliance, Hyundai Motor Group, Stellantis, GM, Honda. So a thing that jumps out here is that you see some of these top automakers, top auto groups are not on those other lists at all. Toyota, most notably, it's the leader globally for vehicle sales, but it's been a laggard in, in plug-in vehicle sales, especially full electrics. Uh, you also you have Volkswagen, of course, a little higher up here, number two, but but you do see it on the other lists. Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi Alliance, again, absent from the other lists. They led early on with the Nissan Leaf and the Renault Zoe, but they've been a bit slow to, to keep evolving and keep um, putting compelling v electric vehicles on the market. You do have Hyundai Motor Group again, but then you're, you, you've got Stellantis, GM, Honda, Ford, these major automakers, uh, all these auto, major auto brands underneath some of them um, that are just not at the top of the top for electric vehicle sales yet. But they, you know, some of them are moving. So we'll talk about that. So that's looking at the global market. I want to just touch on the Chinese market for a moment. Our audience here is clearly not the Chinese market, um, but you have to note it. Over 60% of electric vehicles sold globally are sold in China. So the Chinese market is the dominant electric vehicle market. That's why you see these popular Chinese brands, some of whom only sell in China, on the top of the global list. So if you look at the top 20 plug-in vehicles, and the ones that are bold are fully electric. The ones that are not bold are either plug-in hybrid or a mixture. If you look at these top 20 plug-in vehicles in China for the first eight months of the year, you see at the top of the list a small Chinese uh, vehicle. It's, it's actually a, it's a joint venture with GM. So GM has 49% stake, I think, in that. But uh, it's a very small Chinese EV that sells for about $5,000. Um, it's a bit controversial. A lot of people don't want it on these lists. I don't see why it shouldn't be since it is used as a car. It does have a roof, four doors. Uh, I'm not sure four doors, but it has doors, a roof, and, and it takes you where you where you want to commute and go, sh go shopping. Uh, and then you see one of the clear things you see here is how BYD just dominates this market. You have the BYD Song Plus, the BYD Chin Plus, BYD Han, BYD Dolphin, BYD Yan Plus, EV, BYD Tang, and those are all in the top 10. So it's just an absolutely dominant automaker. It's not the biggest automaker in China, but it's clearly the biggest plug-in uh, maker in China. And earlier this year, it completely uh, closed out production of pure fossil fuel vehicles. It only produces fully electric and plug-in hybrid vehicles since a few months ago. And um, clearly is you know looking to transition to full electric only, but it does have, uh, it, it's serving the people who want plug-in hybrids quite well. You do, of course, see Tesla on that list as well. Tesla does well in every market. The Model Y is sometimes a top-selling vehicle there, but it, for the first eight months combined, it is number four. Its biggest sales month is always the last month of the quarter, so it should climb a bit in after September's numbers come in, but it still might just be four. Um, then you have to go down quite far before you find another non-Chinese vehicle, which is the Model 3, Tesla Model 3. And then you have the Volkswagen ID4 down there near the bottom. And every other vehicle on this list is a full electric vehicle. But the most fascinating thing about the Chinese market to me, actually, is if you have a bar for others, it's enormous. And all these bars will look tiny because it has, there's, so, there's like over 100 electric vehicle models in China. It's a very mature market. They've done a great job incentivizing the transition to EVs. And they have uh, about 20% of new vehicle sales are, are electric now. So that's just, you know, we're not going to talk about those, all these Chinese brands and, and models because that's not our focus here in the U.S., but it's important to recognize what's going on there. Sorry, I don't know if my video's going away. I have a, another hurricane warning coming in. <laughs> um, so this is just, oh, so this is the last look at these Chinese. So these are all Chinese vehicle models, and you can see they're, they're very diverse. You have that small one on the bottom that's the top seller. You have these more luxurious ones. You've got 
uh, sort of mid-market premium ones that are a bit like a Tesla, the Xpeng on the on the top right, the Neo ET5 on the left, and then down on the bottom right is Aura. One of these Aura cats. There's Aura black cat, Aura white cat, Aura funky cat, I think, Aura good cat. There's all these fun, funny cat um, models from Aura, uh, which are quite popular as well. Like the the small one on the bottom, a bit cheaper, more more of an urban car, and very appealing to young women, which uh, is apparently a very important market for automakers. But that's it for Ozeker on the top left is sort of is this luxury brand underneath Geely. So it's related to Volvo and um, that might move the top three that might be sold in, in well, will be sold in Europe and maybe the US down the road, but not yet. Uh, so that's that's it for sort of the broad picture. Now we're going to dive into each automaker a little bit. Uh, first automaker to talk about, I think, is clearly Tesla. It's driven the market for EVs more than any other any other brand, any other uh, company. Its production rate is now over a million vehicles per year, which is quite stunning when you think 10 years ago, the Model S, the first few Model S's were delivered. So it was just in 2012 that the Model S began getting into customer homes. And now 10 years later, Tesla's selling over a million vehicles per year. It has a goal of 20 million vehicles per year by 2030. If you remember that slide on 2021 top sellers, uh, number one was Toyota, a bit over 10 million. So Tesla's goal of 20 million a year is pretty ambitious. And a lot of people are very skeptical that it will achieve that. But Elon Musk is known for ambitious goals and sometimes achieves them, sometimes uh, is a bit too ambitious. Uh, I think a key thread that you're going to see among top automakers for EVs is that they're very involved now in the battery production side of things. And even like a few years ago, they, they were getting involved in battery cell and battery pack production and started procuring more, uh, more ahead of time, more ambitiously, the minerals. But now you see a lot more, even the some of the automakers getting into mineral extraction or refining. Um, Tesla, an example, they're, they're looking into refining lithium in Texas. They're um, looking into extracting lithium. Um, but this is just something, uh, a trend that I think you're going to see more and more. And you're just going to see the top automakers in the EVs transition, looking to secure their minerals as well as possible and as cheaply as possible. Uh, so we'll go on to the next slide. So BYD is clearly the second brand to mention. Now they're selling about a million full electric vehicles per year now. They're at that rate now. So they're actually climbing. They've been climbing quite strongly. Sorry. And um, they might actually be catching up to Tesla in monthly full electric vehicle sales, excluding the plug-in hybrids, which they call DM, dual motor, I think, model sales. So just looking at full electrics, they're climbing up to Tesla. Of course, Tesla is also looking to ramp up, so it might climb away. Um, so it's got those around a million BVs and about a million, over a million plug-in hybrids uh, per year as well. Um, and then it's, as I've pointed out, it's got a large lineup of different models, whereas Tesla's got basically four models and two mass market models, two mass market and two very low volume models. BYD has, uh, they have the top selling model in every plug-in class, in almost every plug-in class in, in China. So they're, they've got a model for each kind of category. Uh, they're also a major battery producer. It's actually, they started as a major battery producer. So they've, they've had a very integrated um, battery supply side of, uh, from the beginning. We can jump to the next company, which is Volkswagen Group. Volkswagen Group, there are brands that have more ambitious goals, like Volvo. Volvo Cars aims for 100% electric vehicle sales by 2030. It's just a smaller brand. It's not, um, we're trying to focus on the bigger uh, brands here. So Volkswagen Group is producing about half a million BEVs a year now. It plans to sell 3 million BEVs in 2025. So it's got a big uh, production ramp up goal here. Uh, and it plans for about 50% of its sales to be BEV by 2030, which if you estimate that they aim for 10 million vehicle sales a year, which is not clear, that would be 5 million BEVs uh, in 2020, 2030. Uh, and they, again, like like BYD, they have a very hugely diverse uh, model lineup, a lot of vehicle models to choose from, and they just keep rolling out more. 
uh, unlike Tesla, which has a very limited number and they're always top sellers, uh, Volkswagen's all over the board. Uh, also comes partly because Volkswagen Group is Volkswagen, Audi, Porsche, Skoda, Seat, Lamborghini. They're a bunch of brands, so they they have um, they have to have BEV models for each brand. Uh, and again, they've gotten more into hands-on battery mineral extraction contracts, joint venture, battery cell and pack factories, and just recently started its own battery cell production uh, facility in Europe um, instead of just uh, doing joint ventures with, for example, Northvolt or other battery makers. So again, they're getting more and more integrated in the deeper supply chain of batteries. And then we've got Stellantis, which a lot of Americans especially are like, who? Uh, but Stellantis is the parent company that now is uh, the umbrella company of Peugeot, Citroen, Fiat, Dodge, Chrysler, Ram, Opel, Jeep. Uh, so it's it's just, it owns a lot of brands. And it's had a very simple <laughs> pro sort of approach to electric vehicles, but it's implemented that quite well in Europe in the past few years, such that it's already risen to number two in plug-in vehicle sales in Europe, which a lot of people do not know and would not expect. So they've just been creating electric versions of their conventional fossil fueled vehicles for the most part. Of course, like every automaker, they're developing BEV centric platforms that will create better BEVs down the road, but they've gone, they've done surprisingly well with this um, simple model uh, for now. Uh, in 2026, every single model they release will have a BEV option. So yeah, you will have an electric version of everything. Again, that sort of continues their trend of electrifying gas or diesel uh, vehicles, which is a dubious approach, but is working quite well for them. As far as batteries go, they just recently announced a joint factory with Samsung SDI in Indiana, a joint factory with Cattle, the largest battery producer in the world, a Chinese company in Canada. So again, they're involved. I don't see signs of them getting involved in the mineral extraction or refining, but uh, a lot of that stuff is also done quietly, but I don't think they are. I think really it's just been a couple of companies, most notably Tesla, that's been uh, getting into that at this stage. Uh, so we'll go to the next. Hyundai Kia is a fascinating uh, group here because from the beginning, they've developed extremely popular electric models that, I mean, I think EV fans have, have put, I mean, they've been just right behind Tesla as far as enthusiasm for their electric models from what I've seen. So that was even just electrifying the Kia Niro and Hyundai Kona uh, a, while, a couple of years back, and those were very popular models. They were not produced in high volume nonetheless. Uh, which, you know, limited Kia and Hyundai potential to sort of grab market in this new new arena. But now they're, they're rolling out models developed with electric-centric, electric-based platforms that are even much more compelling, I would say, and really exciting a lot of people. You got the Hyundai Ioniq 5 up there on the top right, the Kia EV6 on the bottom right. They're just uh, beautiful cars. What what Kia and Hyundai have done really well is making their EVs efficient, very efficient. So they often have some of the most efficient EVs on the market, which just gets more range out of the battery. So you have smaller, you need smaller batteries and you can have lower costs or you just have more range for the cost. So it's just make, made them more competitive than a lot of other brands. And you see them in those top, in that top ranking for BEV sales, number five, I think it was. Um, and they have seized development of internal combustion engine technology. They're no longer developing ICE technology. I would say this is actually, while, while they got good press for this, I think this is actually common across the industry. I think it was five years ago, we hosted a conference in, in Europe and I was talking to um, a company that designs platforms for automakers. And they said that no automaker any longer wanted a platform design that wasn't electric focused. So, I, you know, that's the first stage of like a, of maybe an eight year process. And even five years ago, I think automakers were done designing uh, new models around, you know, new engines and that kind of thing. So, uh, but, you know, Hyundai Kia announced they've seized development of ICE technology and they're a bit of a leader in that regard, at least. Uh, but how many will Hyundai and Kia build? This has been the question with Hyundai and Kia from for, for years now. They develop really compelling electric models that people want. 
but they don't seem that intent on very high, high, high scale, uh, high volume ma manufacturing, like you see perhaps from Volkswagen Group or, or or Tesla, of course. But they maybe they they don't talk about it much. But I would assume at this point, with these electric from the ground up options and seeing where the market is going, that they're also looking to ramp up production more than uh, as fast as possible. Basically, we'll see. Hey, hey, Zach, a quick a quick time check. Aaron has a hard stop at uh, 2.40. Okay. So I'll just, I'll just wrap these up real quick. Okay. So GM has uh, has started bringing, has, has sort of led in some ways, but they've brought low volume models to market that are not super exciting for the most part. The Chevy Bolt is a great low cost option, but it's not super exciting. And I don't think it's done particularly well for the brands. Um, it does have a goal of 100% electric by 2035. And it's also getting into more markets like electric delivery market. And then I think we're on to Ford, which uh, I love Ford's approach. They were very slow to get involved. But then when they got involved, they set up this Team Edison, a very small, st basically, startup within the company. They told them, do whatever you need to make the most exciting vehicles possible, the best electric vehicles that will sell the best. They decided to electrify their most iconic brands, the Mustang and, and Ford F-150. And I think they made phenomenal vehicles. And I'm really excited with what they've done. They've seen so much interest that they've like doubled their production targets for some for these vehicles. And they have a goal of reaching 2 million EVs a year uh, by 2026, which is still a bit behind those other companies. But I think as they see more uh, interest, they will get more involved. They just recently launched Blue Oval City, a giant new EV and battery factory, which is a collab with SK On. And I think that's near the end of my presentation. If there's, uh, this is maybe the last slide. This just shows the share of automakers total auto sales in the US. And you can see sort of who's leading in that regard. If you look at share of sales, but it's a similar story. Uh, I think that's it for me. Uh, there, yeah, so that I wanted to end with Ford so Aaron could take over and talk about his F-150 Lightning, which we have a separate podcast. Uh, it's yes. not public yet, but it will be published with me interviewing Aaron about the F-150 Lightning, the Mustang Mach-E, which he also has had, and uh, and other things. Yeah, exactly. We do want to, uh, Aaron was talking about that, and we want, we'll get that to our uh, all of our uh, Electrify Now viewers and subscribers uh, when that's out. Uh, and, and, and Zach, if you need to go because of the hurricane, we totally understand if you're able to, to stay. Um, we also have your colleague, Joe. Yeah, hopefully we'll be, able to, uh, yeah. we'll be able to ask you, well, Diane asked you a bunch of questions about that yeah. um, in a dialogue form, but we gotta, need to jump to Aaron before he has to take off and then maybe we can come back and hit some of those questions. Um, yeah, I will stay here. It keeps my mind off the hurricane. So I'm here as long as I have internet yeah. and electricity. <laughs> I'm okay. just glad you're safe. All, All right, right, Aaron, we'll show us around. Yeah, great. Hey, thanks everyone. Uh, you know, welcome to my home. We've got uh, 10.54 kilowatts of solar on the roof. We're working to electrify our house. We have electrified our driveway with a uh, Ford Mach-E. Uh, today, I'm gonna show you my Ford F-150 uh, Lightning. So really pleased with that. I'm gonna spin my camera around here so we get a little bit better view. I'll try not to make you seasick. The first question I always get is, let's open the front. We wanna see this. It's a really cool, um, you know, there's there's nothing in the, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we hear okay. you great. Okay. Uh, there's no engine in here. There's actually a little uh, tailgating cooler, but I've got uh, some of my batteries from my Milwaukee tools plugged in here. The front has a 120 volt, 20 amp, 2.4 kilowatt max battery charger. And I actually took one of my job site uh, compressors here and plugged this in for you so you can see but oh, of course, it's uh, I got to turn it back on. I uh, I'll show you that in a second. Let, let me sorry. Let me turn the truck back on. This will be kind of fun. All right, and connect to the the truck. Look at. It. Aaron, we're losing you here a little bit. I know he mentioned earlier that when he turns his truck on, it takes over his phone. So he might be having to disconnect from his phone there. I don't know. We're just getting, does any of the other panelists have any comments on the great uh, lightning that they've seen so far? The robots are taking over, I think. 
<laughs> yeah, no, he mentioned this before. This was a problem. Um, he was, you know, while we're waiting for him to come back on, he was talking about uh, how he had a power outage a couple of weeks ago and was driving his house and his neighbor's house and uh, all the, the kids' Wi-Fi and the, the deep freeze coolers and the fish tanks um, for two or three houses for the better part of a day and only took about 5% of his battery to do that. So, you know, this whole um, concept of vehicle to grid thing, this is one of the, one of the most exciting aspects of this car. And I, I know that Aaron is wanting to demonstrate that, but it seems like we've lost him there. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Joe, and welcome, Joe Boris from Clean Technica as well. Yeah, I see, I see your hand up. Go ahead and. Uh. Yeah, thanks. You know, I was talking about this, and um, you know, we were looking at the uh, the average home uses something like seven hundred kilowatts or eight hundred kilowatt hours of energy a month, and that's with air conditioning, TVs, kids on computers, washing machines, everything else. And with about a hundred kilowatt battery pack, I mean, you could really run your home completely. Uh, you know, com normally without having any kind of interruption to your daily life for several days with one of these uh, EVs, you know, with vehicle to grid or vehicle to home technology. So I was started thinking about, you know, these large uh, semi trucks that are, have 700 kilowatt hour battery packs and these large RVs that have multiple hundreds of kilowatt hours. You know, you could have a major storm like Zachary's experiencing right now come through and still be kind of good to go for several days. It might not even interrupt you. So uh, it's really exciting stuff. And uh, obviously he's back now with the light and so I'll, I'll be quiet. Yeah, yeah Aaron, we lost that you there for a minute, but uh, are you, oh. damn, we lost him again. <laughs> um, well, today is a, it's an interesting day of hurricanes and, and technical know, hurricanes and yeah, but a great, that was the one guy who's in the hurricane has like no issues. <laughs> uh, but he, he did make the joke that I could probably use that truck uh, after the, during or after the storm. And I'm afraid that, that, that this, that's the case. But I, I will say I've always been intrigued by it. I've always liked the idea of it. But going through this hurricane, going into this hurricane, I was thinking, man, I really could use one of those trucks. <laughs> oh, there, Aaron's back. Aaron, are, are, do we have you back? Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, so so we kind of covered the, the powering your house part of it, but if you could give us the rest of the yeah, tour, it'd be great. Yeah, I'm gonna give you the quick tour. So, did you see the frunk in the front? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We saw a good part of the frunk. And I fired the outlets up in the front. So. My air compressor running out the front. You know, beautiful truck. This is the Lariat uh, edition. 131 kilowatt power battery inside. Here's the back. I actually, I actually plug in. Can you hear me? Yep. I, I think you may be on audio for your truck. I'm not sure if it's. I know my truck. Keep, the truck's too smart. It keeps. Yeah. Audio. So I do have the back um, plugged into a car charger. So you can see that there. And there's an option for kind of level one charging at 110. 120 and then a level two charging, which would be about 240. Um, so that's phenomenal. Uh, we'll take you underneath and you can kind of see the uh, electric engine on the front uh, and the back. And then I'm just worried that my phone won't pick up from it. So I'm just going to take you inside the truck. Yeah, have you, Aaron? Have, have cool you, features have, here. This have is. Have you showed anything with the truck? Giant yet? screen. Yeah. Which, go ahead. No, sorry, I have you, not have you showed anything with it yet? But go ahead, Joe. Yeah, no, just uh, you go. No, so the, I was just showing. You know, there's a normal mode. There's a sport mode. I think when I'm in sport mode in the extended range, I do zero to sixty in about. 3.8 seconds on an 8,500 pound truck, which is pretty darn fun. <laughs> and then we've got the option for one pedal driving on that as well. Um, so lots of uh, great features. There's also a, a 20 amp uh, plug here inside of the truck. So it's really um, Joe and Brian and Zach, kind of this mobile battery 
uh, generator system. I think Brian shared some pictures or Ken shared some pictures of, you know, the story and Jack, you know, obviously our thoughts are with you, but um, we had a power outage here in Minneapolis and I went to my neighbor, my power was still on, went to my neighbor's houses. And I think we plugged in three drop-in freezers, four refrigerators, um, a fish tank, because the fish were gonna die. Uh, we ran an electric Traeger smoker grill. The kids actually ran the internet and then plugged all their cell phones in. So for about six hours of running several houses worth of critical systems, we used about 5% battery power on the 131 kilowatts. And then I just wanna get to that gas part that Brian talked about in his presentation. But generally I do, so uh, my other hat, I, I run uh, Green Smith Builders, which is an all electric net zero home builder uh, and multifamily builder. So I usually do a 200 mile each direction road trip. Obviously charging my house here for free on solar. Something changed with the with the voice, and we're not hearing you well. It's very very distant. Um, okay. Here, I'll roll the windows. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, yeah totally better. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, uh, but I used to spend two hundred fifty dollars in gas round trip on that um, on that four hundred plus mile trip with my old Dodge Ram fifteen hundred. Um, I charge it at home for free, and then I have to charge it on the other end on a level two charger, and it's about $18 on that trip. So I've gone from two something a week to $18 a week in gas, and, and Joe, your comment, yeah, towing will significantly reduce the range, and, you know, it, it's very, you know, it's very dependent on your driving style. Um, I will get four to six uh, miles per kilowatt hour in the city. And then out on the highway, it could be 1.7, 1.8, 2.0. Just depends on how fast I'm, I'm going or how much wind I'm fighting. Uh, but tell us about the uh, bi bi-directional charger that you've uh, ordered. Yeah. So the this the Lariat comes with an 80 amp charger, which I showed to uh, Joe before we got started. And that charger is essentially a level three charger, right, Joe? It, it's, a, it's got a CCS connection, which is, yeah, level three. Yeah, yeah, so CCS connection. I'll run a 100 amp circuit to my garage. I'll have that 80 amp charger on there. And then for another 3895 from Ford and Sunrun, you get the intelligent home backup uh, system, which allows you to run your house intelligent backup power. So we'll um, get that order and get that installed in the house next. And that will be able to allow me to create a microgrid. And I think Brian and I were talking before that with 131 kilowatt hours on tap, you know, if you just run critical systems in your house, Brian, how long did you think I could run things for? Uh, Pretty several, significant several. amount of time. I mean, it, it depends on, you know, you could probably run your whole house for a couple of days with everything running normally. But if you if you cut back, you know, and don't use your your heat pump for heating or air conditioning, you know, you could go weeks um, with that amount of uh, yeah. power. So it's like, what do we figure, like two or three Tesla uh, power wall systems that you've got? there? Uh, I, think, that. I think the, that. so that, you know, that's an interesting thing, right? I think we're in this era and Zach and I talked about this on the podcast, but this truck is the equivalent to five Tesla power walls. Five power walls, yeah. Yeah, and five Tesla power walls would cost $125,000. Right. This particular truck is 76,000. So did I also get five power walls for the cost of my truck? And I've got a great truck uh, that is just so fun to drive. And uh, the Blue Cruise, I don't know, I showed you a little bit of the Blue Cruise, but um, that's the cameras for Blue Cruise. And that's the cameras for Blue Cruise. So it is driver monitoring. And then I can click this on. It's going to do uh, lane key. Keeping, and it's going to do, um, you know, radar to the cars in front. Does not do automatic lane change. But I find highway when I go into that Blue Cruise mode that it's made driving very very exciting for me again when you want it to be and very peaceful when I don't yeah. want to worry about driving. 
Aaron, you, there's, there's one, one thing, one feature you showed well, us a little bit earlier that uh, I want to just uh, ask you to talk about again, that, that kind of um, being able to charge other electric vehicles from your truck. Yeah, I'm going to go show you that, but you might not hear me on audio, okay? Okay. Yeah. So we'll okay. jump out here. So basically he's got this set up if you can't, I don't think we'll be able to hear him, but he's got it set up. So he's plugged in a car charger, his Ford car charger to his battery. So he can now charge another car with his battery. So imagine, you know, which is always something that I think a lot of us wonder about, like what if you get stranded somewhere in your car, you're running out of battery or something like that. And it used to be your, somebody could come along and jumpstart you or whatever it was, give you a can of gas. This, this is sort of the equivalent to that in a way that you could get a little level two charge um, out of someone else's car to get you maybe to the nearest charging station, which is kind of cool um, feature, I yeah. think, that just makes the whole system work, feel like it works better, you know, of electric vehicles around the world. Yeah, we, we reviewed this truck on our YouTube channel as well recently, and the, the, the reviewers have a Model 3, and they did they actually plugged it in, they demonstrated it works, so they were charging their Model 3 with the F-150 Lightning, which was very just, cool. I mean, it's awesome to see it for, what took so long? Like, this is, ama this yeah. is an amazing feature. Yeah. 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 Well, the other thing, that, you know, that point, that comparison of the, you know, the, the four the drop. Okay. Aaron, okay. Thanks, thanks so much. Everyone. Everyone. Our hard stop. Really appreciate okay. it. Thank yeah. you, Todd. Bye. All right. So that you know that uh, comparison of you know five Tesla Powerwalls to the price, you know, et cetera, and and the things that always bug me about the the home backup battery systems is they're largely unused. It's a lot of really expensive materials that you hardly ever use, which it's always bugged me a little bit. You know, whereas with the car it's something you're using all the time and then in the emergency situation when you need the backup power you have it it's just such a smart smart uh thing there all right well thanks uh, i mean aaron that was that was amazing zachary i'm so glad you're still able uh, to be on with us why don't we turn it over to uh, jr looks like you well, have your hand up but sorry joe i'm just thinking in case we lose zach i wonder if we could i have I'm dying to ask you a few questions about your presentation maybe before just because i would hate it if you just suddenly cut out yeah. on us but Okay. Um, I, I wanted to ask you just a few things like you mentioned that um, Toyota, for example, Honda, the two big Japanese automakers who are very dominant in terms of overall automobile sales around the world are not even on the top 10 um, battery EV list. What's going on there? I mean, what, what do you see happening there? Is that going to change or is that just going to doom them um, eventually or what's, what's happening? Well, I would just note that Toyota just basically just is rolling out its first full electric vehicle. If you don't count some previous like generation, Honda sort of has rolled out one. It's very low, <laughs> low volume. It's like almost not not mentionable. Uh, but the the thing that's always that I learned at some point, which stuck with me with Toyota and Honda, is that leaders in one tech transition are often the biggest laggards in the next one. So because they led with hybrids conventional hybrids that's made Toyota and Honda reticent to jump into the next era and sort of give up that leadership role or it's just it just had so much success as the the leader of hybrids that I think it's been a little bit more it hasn't had the ambition for full electrics and sort of had to trying to drag out the hybrid era as how I see it um there's also just issues with Japan they've got this um there's a lot, it's a whole discussion about their kind of interest in hydrogen. Uh, there's theories about whether they have a very strong interest in hydrogen because of the size of their country. There's theories because of uh, resources off their coast that could prove profitable if we relied on a hydrogen economy. But I think there's something going on with not just their leadership, but sort of the leadership in Japan where they've put a lot more emphasis on hydrogen vehicles, which have not just are not as competitive for a lot of reasons. Um, and I, I don't think ever will be for passenger vehicles, just fundamental phys physics reasons. But I think that's that's held them back. And I mean, Toyota and Honda fans will often say, oh, don't worry, when they're ready to get in, they know more about batteries than anyone because of their hybrid past. And when they jump in, they'll, they'll still dominate. It's 
you know, a lot of people think they're 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 going to face extreme reckoning for being so slow in this in this uh, transition. Um, I've stopped predicting because it's hard to predict, <laughs> but I do think they're. I think it's astounding that they're still this far behind, that they're still not jumping in like the other automakers are. And for now, Toyota was a top seller last year globally. Um, I'm just, I don't see Toyota remaining number one in the years to come with uh, this slow transition, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Not only not jumping in sometimes, I mean, they're actively discouraging the adoption yeah. of electric vehicles. We read about Seems that. Like it, yeah. <laughs> Terrible yeah. press. Another question for you about the Chinese cars and um, GR jump in here too, but you know, it's, it's really striking one, just how many cars they're making over there and, you know, looking at them, they look like they're good cars. I think the idea it's hard to imagine here in the United States, people like embracing a Chinese car. I just have to say it, you know, it just feels hard. But then again, you would have said that about the Japanese cars, you know, 50 years ago too. And, and they become one of the big automakers here. When, when people used to call them rice burners and all sorts of derogatory names when they first came out here, now they're you know just normal. And so Korean cars you, in the '90s, the Kia, Kias. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, in fairness, too, though, so you, we have Chinese that? cars in the U.S. already. They're sold as like, you know, the Honda Fit was made in China. A lot of the mm. Volvo S60s are made in China. So, like, I think it's more of a question of branding than anything else, right? Will mm. a Chinese yeah. brand be accepted? Because we've already accepted Chinese products. We're all here talking on yeah. <laughs> iPhones and MacBooks that were made yeah. in China. Yeah. So I don't think yeah. that's going to be the issue. Yep, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah, well, on that, you know, there's, I would just highlight again, in China, there's just extremely diverse approaches to the EV EV transition. So you have these very low cost city cars you have. And I would say within that, you have the smartest, in my opinion, the smartest EV, like the most advanced technology EV companies in the world. Alongside Tesla, you have Xpeng and Neo, which I think have the most, Xpeng especially has a very uh, uh, full stack fully integrated software and hardware development teams that are making, I think, some of the most advanced technology EVs on the market, Neo as well. And those are the brands that are going into Europe already and would go into the US later. The US market is the last is a last uh, last concern for all of these automakers, European and Chinese automakers, because um, it's, uh, you know, Europe requires it and there's a lot more, uh, they're a lot further along the adoption curve and the U.S. has a number of issues that sort of make it harder to sell, harder to break into. But um, but I, I think there are really some extremely enticing, exciting EVs coming out of China. And I always do wonder as well, can they sell as Chinese brands? Of course, Volvo Cars is going to do great and Volvo is a Chinese company, basically. Um, you know, it, it is, <laughs> but, uh, but I, it's the brands that I wonder as well. And we, these debates come up all the time in our comment threads, whether, um, whether they can do it like the Japanese and Koreans did, or, or there's too much of a, mm. of a xenophobic st stigma against Chinese, um, yeah. Yeah. brands. Well, right. well, I'd like to say that I think, I think, um, the adoption of the Chinese vehicles is gonna, is gonna change everything because, you know, now that these vehicles are made and they're basically computers on wheels um, and they're coming out with amazing quality cars that look great. Um, I think Xpong is going to really change the industry. Um, but before we get there, I want to talk about the Ford Lightning and how they were, how that vehicle was released, because I think that's really groundbreaking in the country like America, where the pickup is the first vehicle that most people buy here. And uh, if you drive around America, you just see pickups everywhere. Um, the fact that they launched it with the vehicle to grid option, I think was huge. I think that's changing the whole industry. It's caused everyone to change. Now everyone's talking about implementing the vehicle to grid into their cars. Um, and as we said, you know, you can run your house on a, on a car battery, a large car battery for a week sometimes, depending on the size of your house and the size of the car battery. I think that's going to be a huge game changer in America and eventually um, overseas as well. So, uh, but I'm, I'm looking forward to the, the companies like Xpeng, which is an amazing company. They've only been in business for a number of years and they, they are at the top of the market um, and they're beautiful cars. 
So I'm looking forward to to having a, my hands on all of these vehicles because I think for so long we've been limited um, in America with the types of vehicles that we can get. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I tend to like small cars, so I would drive pretty much anything. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Hey, Before we move on to other topics, I would just ask you, JR, because you were early at Tesla, how much did you see interest in that kind of vehicle to grid technology and, and what was the kind of like what's your thoughts on that from your history at tesla as well yeah i mean it was really not a non-topic like vehicle the grid wasn't brought up back then um you know i think especially now the fact that ford came on the market with that uh as their premier this their primary standpoint i think that was huge um tesla i don't think really thought about it uh, from that standpoint i think now they're kind of like, oh yeah, we, we kind of missed the ball on that. So, you know, and I think they're still being a little bit su stubborn about coming out with that that particular option. Who's I, think, I think there may be a reason for that because they have this whole other market in this Tesla Powerwall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't want to lose that market, right? Exactly. Um, what, one other like really striking thing to me about this whole conversation is this stark difference between, you know, the legacy automakers like Ford and Toyota we talked about is slow, et cetera. But, you know, the idea of transforming your giant business where you've got the whole infrastructure and factories and trained labor and, you know, a supply chain that's really complicated to make IC vehicles, ICEs, and now you got to shift it into batteries versus these new companies that are basically like you said, JR, computer companies, you know, they're making cars. and. What do you see? How do you see that playing out? I mean, obviously, there's advantages and different disadvantages on both sides, but that feels like a real interesting dynamic. And, and, and personally, it would seem to me like it's possible to imagine that some of these legacy guys just won't make it um, and that their lunch is going to get eaten by the start startups. But then there's also some really advantages that these big guys have, you know, from years and years and years of being in the car business that they can probably leverage to squeeze out the little guys, too. So any yeah. comments on that? I mean, I'm sure that's a really complicated topic yeah it, it is complicated um you know i've been i've been able to pick up a couple of different lower cost evs and drive them and you know experiment with the the technology um i think it, it's it's kind of a weird thing because I, I i ask this question pretty much every day I, I i say it out loud like why don't they just hire like great engineers to figure out the infotainment part like that's the only thing they're missing but yeah, I don't know. I think it's just a, a mindset that they go into building a car with, um, you know, old dogs don't want to learn new tricks, I guess. I don't know. But um, for instance, we drive uh, Volkswagen ID4. Um, it's a great driving car. It's, it's a good day to day driver. It's comfortable. But the the electronics is is just very laggy. It's always lagging and it's always, you know, resetting itself and i'm just like like what you know i don't get it but companies like tesla who is at the top of the of that list and i recently had a chance to experience a rivian um in person and i played it played with the screen for a good 20 minutes it just works it's constantly works i mean you you lose some features like you don't get carplay you don't get android play but you have uh, a system that just works from the ground up. And I think that is the difference. Like they've been building this from, from day one because they probably couldn't get contracts with Apple and Android to make these systems. So they had to build it from scratch and it works. It just works. Um, the difference is the quality of the car development is probably a little bit lower and is getting there it's starting to develop better like I, the rivian i saw was amazing that's their first car to me i thought it was built built amazingly i thought it was they did a great job building it i mean a couple of little quirks i've heard complaints about but for the most part the quality of that car looks looks great and uh, like what zachary was saying i just think um you know some of these companies like toyota for instance who have had such success with hybrid they just are just they just keep I don't know dropping the ball they just keep make, you know making the decisions that keep them out of this game and who knows maybe they'll have enough money to buy up a smaller company they they certainly make enough cars to do that and maybe that'll keep them in the run but I 
I'm excited about the future because I think change is necessary and uh, it's be, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the long run when these decisions that they've made play out in, in real time when, you know, we already see what, what Tesla has done. Um, they, they have changed the whole industry. Yeah. So. Yeah. I would say the, the way I always think about it is they have to surf a very thin wave or they have to walk a tightrope because they have to scale down fossil fuel vehicle sales at the same time that they're scaling up electric right. vehicle sales. And there's this, this chart that sort of, show, sort of, it shows how as there's demand rising and then there's like a dip in demand that comes from people waiting for their next vehicle to be EV, not being quite ready to jump in, but not not wanting to buy another gas car. And so then you have you have this weird graph of a rise and a dip and then a rise that they have to somehow surf. You know, it's like they yeah. have to surf two waves. Yeah. And I think that's and I, I mean, I think these 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 discussions happen every day. They've happened every day for years, and I still find them fascinating because it's a really, you know, you have the side that says these automakers are all dead. They're going to crash and burn. There's others who say, no, they're going to be fine. They've got all the resources. They know how to manage this kind of thing. You also have this situation of a lot of auto automakers could just be saved by their governments, uh, you know, bailed fail. out. I mean, yeah. you look at Germany, you yeah. got like those guys are not going under. Like Germany is going to make sure they all survive and well that happened US, here too remember yeah I mean, in the us it already happened the question yeah. is will they do it again and i mean it's a lot of uh, stuff up in the air i would say that i think some of them are doing better making this transition so far than expected um, but there's still a long way to go and it's really you don't know when is demand going to collapse much more than they expected i think i think there was something in the in the auto collapse of 2008 or whatever that was where i saw something like you just need demand to collapse like 10 percent or something or 10 to 20 percent more than expected and you go under like it's not like you have to no have no demand anymore it's just if your your forecast is is off by that much then you're gonna be screwed joe has i'm sure some good comments he's been in the industry for a lot longer has very deep ties in the industry he can <laughs> i i yeah i appreciate your that. video on too? or I don't, okay uh, I'm, I'm walking around on the phone so you can like see my kitchen it'll be very exciting um no so you know so now i got all sidetracked we we're talking about the, the dip in the market and and the demand there and you got to remember that these auto in industries, you know, we're talking about Tesla having the number one margin, the largest margin in the industry. You know, legacy automakers are operating on very small percentages. Dealers are operating on very narrow percentages. You're talking about one to 3% uh, profit margin is what they're operating on. So if demand comes down just after they've made, especially after they've made you know, kind of heavy investments in infrastructure and training and things like that, they run out of cash almost immediately. And if you, you know, General Motors may be very healthy, but if the one dealership in a small, you know, in a rural area of Iowa goes under, GM no longer has a presence there. Um, you know, and we're talking about a lot of people who, who traditionally buy vehicles through dealers. And you've got a new survey that came out yesterday that shows that 74% of Americans are still going to be going through the dealerships to buy their vehicles. So this kind of thing where you're talking about a 10% drop in demand or, or, or more effectively a 10% drop in sales, that's a big, big deal. And I don't even think it needs to be that much if it hits disproportionately, right? Like if it hits, if the Ram dealers get hurt worse than Ford dealers, all of a sudden these manufacturers don't have an outlet for their vehicles and uh, going under yeah. becomes a very real threat. You know, and we talked about the uh, bailouts and the question came up of whether or not the US government would bail out the American automakers again. I think they have. If you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, this idea that the US government is going to pay manufacturers $35 per you know, kilowatt hour of, of uh, battery that's manufactured and assembled in the US, that is a huge shot in the arm for American manufacturing. You know, they don't necessarily call it that. They're calling it, you know, other incentives like $35 here and another 10% or $10 for assembly charges. If you look at something like a Toyota nickel metal hydride battery, um, you know, take lithium ions out of it. The, the standard Toyota battery chemistry is significantly less expensive than a lithium ion, which is somewhere around, I think, $70 per kilowatt hour. They're hovering around 40. So now all of a sudden they're being paid by the U.S. government again, $35 per kilowatt hour plus 10 on the assembly side. 
now they're generating effectively a five dollar profit on every single nickel hydride kilowatt hour that they put into a car that's a huge huge bonus and we might start to see some new battery chemistries come out to take advantage of that cost savings hmm. that's fascinating right. we are um should we pivot to the ira i mean i know well, yeah jr looks like you have your hand up and then uh, maybe we should well, get to the good news in the ira yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that was a good segue, um, Joe. I, you know, I think, I don't know, we talk about the dealer network and that's always like uh, uh, a um, a big conversation, a big argument for me is uh, the problems with the dealer network in America. And I think Ford is starting to see that uh, as they have recently announced that they lose about $2,000 per car. Um, because they're going through the dealership um, and, you know, that, that's a whole But that money problem. doesn't get lost. That money goes into that local economy in the form of employees and taxation. That's a whole different argument. Yeah, but I mean, as far as from a manufacturer's perspective, you know, they, they are losing that money and they're trying to compete with Tesla, who is now leading the industry in, in a lot of ways. Um, so, yeah, I agree with you there. Um, but I do think um you know at the same time just going through two purchases recently uh buying a, a tesla model y um as my wife's car you know going through that process was the easiest process I've, easiest purchase i've ever made um in a vehicle it was amazing um and then picking up the chevy bolt euv at a local chevy dealer in portland was probably the best case of inefficiency you can imagine it was <laughs> and so the car is not the car is not the problem the car was the was probably the best part of that whole thing finally getting it and driving out was was the the challenge but um you know i think these companies need to figure out because like you said they are working at such a, a low margin is where it creates an, it creates a situation where they have to upcharge and try to basically rob people to to make profit and stay in business. Um, so they come up with things to uh, bring up your maintenance charges when if you don't know anything about a car, you you may fall for it. But at the same time, it doesn't set a good um, relationship between the the seller and the buyer. Um, so I think, you know, I think hopefully in my, I'm hoping the, the EV industry will change that as far as the, the auto dealership um, laws in this country. I think hope I'm looking forward to that being a much better um, relationship that people have. And, and it looks like it's kind of leaning more towards the online sales um, and maybe eventually, and, and I think this could, this is a whole other conversation, but I think eventually that could lead into uh, some, some, some changes of, of the law that, that require a manufacturer to go through dealership. And so anyway, we won't go into that, but we'll talk about the IRA in Inflation Reduction Act and um, which is not as fun or exciting as anything else we've talked about, but it is, <laughs> the biggest topic in the industry right now um, is very confusing. Um, you know, I, I have basically taken a look at it, but I wanted to create basically like a five or six minute presentation on it. And um, so, so uh, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, so basically what I've learned is that it's three main changes that the IRA has introduced. Um, and at the end of the day, the IRS, when you do your taxes, are going to have the final say on a lot of this stuff. Um, but the three main changes are that basically Section 30D, which is basically a credit for new vehicles. Section 25E, credit for previously owned electric vehicles, which is new. Section 45W, credit for commercial electric vehicles, which is also new. Um, some other notable changes are the vehicle cap has been removed, but it will start uh, January 1st, 2023. Um, so under the prior law, the rebates were phased out once a manufacturer sold 200,000 EVs in the US. 
Uh, basically, that would be GM and Tesla. Um, I thought Nissan would be in there, but I don't know. They were almost there, I think. And, and Toyota hit it, I think, too. Yeah, yeah Toyota hit it as well. And that's with the, the PHEV, I guess. I know they're a high seller. Um, and then the other thing is the IRA eliminates the vehicle cap for vehicles sold after the end of this year. Um, so basically, right now, if you look at it, the IRA is making it more difficult for the rest of this year to buy an EV. But beginning in the new year, there will be a lot more options. Um, one option being in 2024, excuse me, tax credits will be transferable to the dealer selling the vehicle, provided the dealer registers with the Department of Treasury and satisfies certain requirements. So that means that when you go to purchase a car in 2024, you can take the amount of that tax credit off on the top of the deal. So when you, you'll, you'll have, that tax credit will go to the dealership and you'll get that credit. Uh, you'll get that credit at that moment at the purchase. Joe, you have a question? or a statement? Yeah, so, um, you know, it, it's important to realize that even though the, that tax credit can get forwarded to the dealer, you're anticipating that you're going to have a tax burden of at least $7,500. And right. I think if it's not policed properly, someone is going to go in, you know, you talked about dealers and their kind of shady antics. A dealer could have the, the way that it's written, a dealer could have the ability to take that $7,500 tax credit, more likely a $3,500 tax credit, because that's going to be what most people qualify for. Qualify for, right. And apply it to the price of the vehicle. And then when you go to do your taxes at the end of the year, you might get a bill because you right. might not qualify for that entire loan. So let's be very careful when we say that, that yes, it can come off the price of the vehicle, but that only really applies if the consumer buying the vehicle has a sufficient tax burden to qualify for that credit. Yes, yes, definitely. So Joe, Thank, the, the importance there is to think that you may make sure that you owe, if you want to qualify for that EV tax credit and get it right off the top, make sure you owe $7,500 to the federal government at the end of the year. Uh, make sure you have that kind of tax burden, which yeah. is really interesting, right? Because we now have an income tax, not only an income cap, but a price cap on being a bit allowed to get that tax credit. Most exactly. of the tax credits that you get on a Model S or something like that the income of the individual is way over what you would see now. So another right. change that bears repeating is that, yeah, you have to have that tax credit, but most of the people who have that tax credit in theory, or I'm sorry, who have that tax liability in theory will not qualify for this anyway. Right. Well, that was, that was my next slide. So <laughs> I, I appreciate it, but basically just keeping yeah. us on track, baby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so uh, the first the first segment credit for the newer vehicles, new electric vehicles, basically uh, revised and extended tax credits. So, new new eligible EVs purchased in twenty twenty three will qualify for the tax credit. If it is purchased before August sixteenth, the buyer can claim the old tax credit, uh, which excludes Tesla and G Tesla and GM. Um, so there are a few vehicles that are available to claim that old tax credit. Um, but if you purchase after August 16th, then the new rules regarding the farm minerals and the components apply. Um, so this, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Um, and basically, and then the last thing is just about uh, the taxpayer may credit the credit to the dealer to receive the credit as a rebate at the point of sale. As Joe was saying, um, it depends on how much tax you end up owing every year and and so yeah there's a lot to be there's a lot to be careful with with that and i also think the the irs is going to have the final say at the at the end of the day um, i'm a little confused because i thought the big benefit there was that if you don't have the tax liability the dealer will and they will take the credit and pass on the savings to you that is how i is that not yeah. how is there a nuance? I mean, you're saying it's different than you, you're still going to have to have that liability at, at, by tax time. Am I misunderstanding? Because I thought the whole big benefit of this was that you wouldn't have to have the liability anymore because the dealer could take it for you and pass on the savings. Well, yeah. So I think, and Joe can probably talk about that a little bit more, um, but I think um, 
The, yeah, I mean, that's not how I've read it, but I'm certainly no tax attorney. Um, right. I, I will say that for what it's worth, um, and, and Zachary has been right about many, many things that I have misunderstood over the years, so don't take this as criticism. That's the first time that I've heard it represented as that tax credit will be transferred to the dealer against their particular tax liability. Uh, if that's the case, that's phenomenal. Well, I think yeah. that the, the point here too, and we see this with all these clean energy tax credits, is that rules are still being worked out between the Department of Energy and the IRS, and that we, uh, you know, this is a, a reading of the legislation as it's written, but we have lots of uh, nuance to fill in and questions. Lots so of we'll nuance to fill, exactly. So, as I said, this is the reason why I wanted to kind of keep this a fairly simple conversation, is uh, just because there are so many nuances within this conversation. Um, so moving along that line, so the MSRP limits uh, are based on the type of vehicle. So SUVs, vans, and pickup trucks cannot be cannot have MSRP, MSRP over eighty thousand dollars, which will take out a lot of the SUVs and pickup trucks that are available today. Um, other vehicles will be MSRP will be fifty five thousand, and then you have the income limits. So a single person cannot make over one hundred fifty thousand and get this tax credit, uh, head of household, 225, and filing jointly, 300,000. Can we go to the next slide, Brian? I mean, I think one of the interesting things about this, I would just comment is, you know, I think there's been a lot of um, criticism of the current tax credits as benefiting the rich only, which I think is justifiable criticism. I mean, I, on the other hand, I would say, well, if it's helped to get the EV market going, then I'll take that. But right. I think what I see a lot of these things trying to do is make sure that the benefits get to the more, you know, regular people instead of it just flowing to the, the wealthy um, to take advantage of these these savings. So I, I kind of think that's a good thing, but we'll, we'll see how it how it plays out, because there's a lot of, like you say, a lot of uh, nuances, a lot of nuance. And I think as more vehicles become available on the market, mm -hmm. uh, maybe when we allow some of these uh, Chinese vehicles to, to be to be made here, uh, you know, I think that will that will ultimately uh, accomplish what you're saying. Um, so, uh, Joe, you had another statement to say. I, I do not. I must not have taken my hand. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I think his hands okay. up for some reason. All right. So, uh... <laughs> right. Usually I do have something to say. So, understandable <laughs> miscommunication. Uh, so, uh, so for the credit for the newer vehicle, new electric vehicles. Um, so, this is where some of the confusion come in, but this is the, these are the changes that have, that have happened with the original $7,500 tax credit. So now they require um, the final assembly of the vehicle must occur within North America for vehicles sold after October, August 16, 2022. Um, I know a lot of uh, auto manufacturers, I think a lot of Southern Korean auto manufacturers are asking for more time for that. And they're trying to pressure the administration to give them some more time to develop factories in America or just delay this requirement so that they can still consider, still be elig eligible manufacturers in America. Um, the battery component requirements, so 50% of the battery components must be manufactured or assembled in North America. And that will, if that is the case, then you will have the option for the $3,750 $3, tax credit. The other component is, so there's two, they, they've broken up the $7,500 into two segments. The critical mineral requirement, 40% of the minerals must be extracted or processed in the U.S. or a country in which the U.S. has a free trade agreement in effect or recycled in North America. Excuse me. Uh, I'm not going to go into the weeds with that one. Um, we can kind of... I mean, it's interesting, though. I mean, I, I think th there's there's a lot of confusion about this, too, because it's hard to know even which 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 cars qualify according to those criteria right now. There's not much data on that yet. But I think it's important to understand that, you know, the if you think about the effects potentially of this long term, the idea is that it's bringing manufacturing to back to the United yeah, States as part of the whole kind of thing here. It feels yeah. to me like we might experience this weird near term uh, herky jerkiness 
uh, and difficulty with interpreting this and actually implementing it. It might not feel like a lot of things comply, but over the long term, it feels to me like these rules should may mean that there's more cars being made in America, there's more batteries being made in America, and there's more minerals being processed by our friendly allies rather than people we don't really know from far away, which is all, I think, a good thing in the long run. But it feels like we might incur some short-term rockiness with the implementation of this is, is kind of how I'm seeing it. Yeah, I absolutely 100% agree. Yes. I just well, wanted to but, ask, are you going to deal with the foreign entity of concern thing in, a ne in another slide? No, we don't have that. So so I'll just mention, so aside from this, there's an issue that starting in 2024, battery cannot include anything produced or refined or extracted in a foreign entity of concern, which includes China and I Russia. Know. So yeah. basically right now, 60% of lithium is, mine, is, is, is processed in China, 100% of graphite and like every mineral component is between 60 and 100% processed, if not uh, extracted in China. And basically, like all of these batteries are going to have to remove those Chinese components if they're going to be eligible at all for at all. anything starting in 2024. So again, the herky jerkiness gets even more dramatic. And there's a 45X component of the legislation, which is just for the pr producers. We're talking just consumer credits, but producers are going to get serious subsidies for any battery minerals they mine also for any they refine for any cells they produce and for any packs they produce in the u.s only the u.s in the u.s so there's a potential to get subsidies for extracting and refining and pack packing into cells and packing into packs if you bring stuff to the u.s to do it and there's already a lot of companies tesla uh, and other companies battery companies moving into the u.s in order to get these significant subsidies which add up to as what joe was mentioning earlier is add up to a large amount of money mm -hmm. that they're all I mean, on I the table i read recently there's something like 13 new battery plants being planned um to open in the next three years here in the united states it's and i think we've damn. seen maybe oh, yeah. half a dozen announcements since the ira passed and and companies wow. indicating that they are doing it because of the IRA. So it's like, it's it's clear that they're incentivizing that shift. Still, how fast they can do it is a big question. And, and this, I'm concerned uh, as JR is, and uh, you seem to be as well, I think about, you know, figuring out what EVs are actually gonna be eligible for these full subsidies. But at least on the production side, there's a lot going on to, to incentivize it as well. Agreed, yeah, well put. Um... Okay, so we were talking about which vehicles are actually available. So basically, these are the currently available qualifying EVs. Not all of them are actually attainable right now. You may have to wait a little while. Um, for instance, the Cadillac Lyric, um, the Chevy Blazer, Chevy Bolt EUV is available. The Chevy Silverado is not available yet. Um, the Ford F-150 Lightning, uh they are selling them it's hard to get them but they are available and as aaron showed um they are pretty amazing trucks um the ford mustang mach e is available the rivians are interesting because they're right at that they're kind of right at that that uh breaking point where you're you're touching the msrp um i know and I know they had to raise their price on the R1T and the R1S recently. So they may be right above that. Zachy, maybe you can answer that question. Um, I know they were like in the upper 70s. I'm not, and I think I'm not now sure. they I may. thought they were, I thought they didn't qualify, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it, I think it, I think if you get like the, the base model R1T, it may qualify, but probably not the, the R1S. Mm -hmm. um, Cybertruck, we'll see whenever that actually comes to market. Um, the Model 3 and the Model, the Model Y is interesting because if it's if it's considered a class, uh, as an SUV, then it will qualify, but if it's not, it won't. So it just depends. Um, and then the Volkswagen ID4, only the 23, 2023 models made in Tennessee will actually qualify for those. And that's that's literally just be, being the, where the vehicle is assembled and how much the MSRP is? Yeah, so and we don't know. We we don't know about the battery components whether these cars would qualify from that because we don't exactly. know that 
yet. So um, it's possible some of these won't make it for that some reason either. Right. Um, it's, yep. And the uh, and and if I'm, the Chevys and the Teslas won't qualify until 2023. Is that well, 2023, correct? Yeah. yeah. Because they, so, they have, are we just are we just confusing our listeners a little more? Is there anything <laughs> simple we can uh, we can? Well, you saw the you saw the the subtitle in the first the first slide. It was confused yet. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to prep. Well, here's, a, here's a good piece of maybe simple news. Uh, this part yeah. is simpler, I think. Yeah. Yes. So this is a big one. I think. Um, I I think once things kind of normalize right now, inflation is still crazy. Where you know buying a a pre-owned car in general, you're going to pay more than you would have before the pandemic, basically. Um, so uh, so now they've announced that there will be credit for previously owned electric vehicles. Um, the, the requirements are the model year must be at least two years earlier than the calendar year in which the taxpayer bought the vehicle. Uh, basically, the credit will be the lesser of 4000 and 30% of the sales price of the vehicle. Um, and then also that also has a in income limitation as well. Um, and, and this will only apply to vehicles acquired in 2023 through 2032. So if you bought it this year, you're not gonna get the tax credit. Pretty simple. Uh, another big one is the credit for commercial electric vehicles. Um, this one's pretty big, actually. The revised commercial tax credits. So, if the vehicle weighs less than fourteen thousand pounds, uh, it's considered like a, a light, a light vehicle, um, light commercial vehicle. You will be you will qualify for seventy five hundred dollars um, per vehicle. If it's over fourteen thousand pounds, then you can get up to forty thousand uh, dollars as a tax credit for those. There are no critical mineral and battery component component requirements for commercial vehicles, and there are no income limits or MSRP caps. So for commercial, uh, I think this is really setting the tone uh, where the government wants to go as far as like incentivizing the commercial industry, which is which is big. I think, and I think um, right now there's a lot of push for electric trucks and and uh and, and school buses out there um, yeah. So yeah we think this would be but, good for like the rental market too you know like uh, i know hertz is really interested in evs or has expressed that at least and this has got to help them to electrify their fleets i would think does this mean basically a small business could buy an f-150 lightning and get that credit or i mean is that potentially I yeah i mean i would i would think i mean again you know it's, it's a good question. Those are all good questions. Um, it would seem like it. It would seem like it. It would seem like it. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Yeah. Um, I know we've gone quite a bit over, but that's been a great conversation. I wonder what do we want to do to wrap things up here, guys? Yeah. Any any last thoughts given the entire, <laughs> maybe we'll go to three our three panelists. Any last thoughts given the, the, you know the profile of the market the f-150 we got a view we got and the um and the rundown of the ira tax credits maybe you have well, each panelist i did uh, we talked about the chinese component i would just emphasize that um while this might be onerous for the next few years and we'll see i mean right now none of those vehicles would qualify in 2024 because they all have chinese components uh while that might be challenging i think you know right now we have about uh, five percent of them is electric when you get to 50 percent more of the market being electric and you have one country that can be uh, difficult with you know, basically being OPEC by itself and, hey, you're not being nice. We're turning off our cobalt supply or our nickel or lithium supply. You've got no auto industry now. I think that's a huge risk. I mean, whether even yeah. if it was our best friend, you would have to be the situation because you, you can always have a fight with your best friend. They can be like, well, no lithium for you this this year. So I think it's really as, as challenging as it is and as quick of a time it is, I think is a critical solution for energy security, for auto security, for economic security, and for reindustrialization of the United States in a way that's really important for the U.S. So it's got challenges, but I think it's, it's really critical um, for, you know, the next, for the, for the future. So that's what I 
I agree. Just building on that, I mean, because, you know, if, the other way to think about it is like you might look at it and go, wow, it's going to be hard to get a tax credit. Well, the truth is it's going to be hard to get a tax credit if we didn't have this because all the good cars are, are, are you know, they're hitting their, their manufacturing limits. So I'd say that in the, while it's, it does feel like it's going to be a little rocky, I, I agree with you, Zach, it's going to be so good in the long term no, and for no, lots no. of reasons too. You know, one of the other things that I think is really kind of interesting about all this is if you look at where these battery plants and the EV factories are being built, where in the U.S. they're being built, they're being built in, in states that right now are, have huge fossil fuels economies that are oftentimes make those states like push back against this clean energy revolution. And now you're building this economic powerhouse engine in these you know, states that have sort of resisted the transition to clean energy around these clean energy um, technologies is going to help unify, I think, the country around the importance of transitioning to these things as fast as possible. So there, I think there's a lot of really good things that are built into this that are kind of like lurk underneath the surface a little bit, like you were saying, Zach. Well, but to your point also, you've also got you know billions and billions of dollars being invested into not only U.S. jobs and manufacturing jobs, but union jobs as well. Mm in yeah. places like Michigan, Ohio, Indiana. So I think that, you know, just from the topic, you know, we always talk about uh, making the world a better place in terms of, you know, lowering emissions and reducing pollution, but also in terms of, you know, labor equality and, you know, labor benefits and healthcare and things like that. There's a lot, a lot, a lot yeah. in this bill that makes it a good thing. And we're not going to even start to see it for three or four years down the road. Yeah, yeah, I That's agree. Good. You know, I, I want to say one thing. And somebody was asking me the other day, uh, how do I, how do we start the conversation with people um, who may just have a different viewpoint on life and human involvement with climate change and things like that, um, which I think is, you know, as we know what's going on in the country right now, like things are just very divided. And uh, I think vehicles like the Ford F-150 are able to kind of bridge that gap. Um, I, I we went, uh, my family went camping recently, and I I had drive a Ford F one fifty Power Boost for work, and I took the Power Boost camping. So it, it's a hybrid. So as we pull into the camping site, it was driving on electric, and I literally before I even parked the car, I had three guys come up to me, and they were like, "Is is that the lightning?" And you know, so I think I think those types of things will ultimately be the change. So I think the government government makes the, you know, these standards set and then people will fall into place depending on what's best for their pockets and what the manufacturers are building. And that's all based on what the government is, you know, the emission standards or whatever that are put on in each state. So I think these are all amazing amazing changes that are happening and i think it's still kind of like we're going through growing pains um i remember growing up and my i was growing six inches in a year and my knees were hurting <laughs> this, this is that like we're, we're just going i never experienced pains. that so, <laughs> yeah i don't think i grew six inches over it took me like 50 years to grow that <laughs> so I, I, I jr i love that i love, I that, love idea. that the, the <laughs> idea of uniting this uh, this technology uniting us um uh, especially around Aaron's uh, F-150 Lightning. Hopefully hopefully this webinar helped uh, do that a little bit. Um, I think we are, this may set a record for our longest webinar, but it, there was yeah. a lot to talk about. And, and a huge thank you to uh, to Aaron, who's not a call, to Zachary for being on during a hurricane and sharing yes. his expertise. To <laughs> Joe you, for coming in at the last safe. minute. Yeah, oh, yeah. to JR. Amazing, okay. And of course, always to Brian. Thank you to all you for listening. Um, I th I'd say... Follow uh, all developments in real time at Clean Technica. If you're not already reading them all the time, read them every day. Um, and yeah, <laughs> keep calm and charge on. Uh, yes, you know, any any questions uh, can be answered usually uh, at Clean Technica and all their amazing content. And we'll do our best to get uh, information out as well as we as we learn more about these uh, tax credits. So thanks to everybody. Um, and Brian, any, anything else? Any last words? No, so, just uh, thanks all for listening and thanks for the panelists and good luck everyone out there with your electrification projects. And let us know if we can help you in any way. We're always here to 
consult if or help you if we can. Thank you. We'll see you for Electrify Week in two weeks. Thanks, everybody. Stay right, safe. Bye. 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 Thanks.